Hello, it's the ghost. Welcome to A Stranger World Than Fiction, where we are taking a look at what's all going on out there, the oddities, the strange, that others are claiming to be true. Today's is an encounter, or a sighting, I guess you would call it more appropriately, a story passed down from one generation to the next. Does it count if those involved told a friend, and now we have the friend telling the tale of what happened? We talk about the strange and unusual here on Stranger World. We are a world, a planet of generations after generations, and unlike the creatures we may know of or have heard of, our lifespan is somewhat limited in comparison. If you've ever sat down with the chat with your grandfather, surely he's told you a tale or two about things that happened to him in the past, how things were, and what he experienced. If you had seen something in your life that was extremely amazing, would you keep it in for most of your life? Would you tell someone? If it came down to your days were now numbered, would you tell somebody then? We already feel so far removed from the generations that come before us. Your grandfather, if he told you this tale I'm about to share, let yourself think, would you believe it? Let's take a look, and then you can tell me if you do. Veteran Grandfather tells my friend about his alien encounter on his deathbed. Well, that's an interesting title. Let's see what they have to say. My friend's grandfather died about 15 years ago and was regarded by his family as a straight shooter. No bullshit kind of guy. He served in World War II in the South Pacific and rarely, if ever, spoke about his time in the military. Two weeks before his death, he called my friend into his room and asked him to please pay very careful attention to what he had to say. My friend was 13 at the time. He goes on to explain that during his time as a soldier near the end of World War II, One of the duties he was often asked to do was survey these tiny islands in the South Pacific for evidence of Japanese soldiers that may have been stranded or living in hiding. Usually, he would go along with two or three other men and search these tiny islands over the course of a day or two. One afternoon, he is tasked to survey a particularly tiny island with three other men. Two men went off to search one side of the island, while my friend's grandfather sets off in the opposite with an equally young fellow soldier. There was a large rock that they decided to climb in order to get a better view of the surrounding area. After climbing, the other soldier spots a large odd object with his binoculars in a tree with their view being mostly obstructed by other trees. It was clearly metal and gray, but they were unable to tell what it was. They then agreed that they needed to get slightly closer to investigate. As stealthily as they could manage, they moved through the terrain to get closer. They hid under the cover of some vegetation, with my friend's grandfather holding the binoculars and his partner holding his gun. Through the binoculars, he gets a clear view of the object. It's a large gray craft that was roughly 40 feet in length. It was shaped like an almond, except that there was a large bubble-like shelf on one side that ran along it lengthwise. It had no windows and was uniform in color and texture, which was an obsidian gray. Part of the craft was being supported on a few large tree branches, and the other half seemed to be suspended in air. Standing on the shelf of a vehicle was a roughly seven-foot-tall, slender humanoid creature that was facing towards the craft. It had an enlarged head, and the skin was like a dolphin's. It was clearly touching the craft, and flashes of light could be seen whenever it touched it. Underneath the craft were two other identical humanoids facing one another, but unmoving, as if frozen. They had large black eyes that looked like an owl's, but without a nose or mouth. Through the binoculars, he was trying to get a better view of one of the aliens' faces when it suddenly looked directly at their hiding spot. The next thing he knows, he's standing alongside his partner, completely paralyzed, and now only an arm's length away from a single alien. The gun and binoculars are on the ground, and the only thing he can move are his eyes. 
The alien towers over him for a few seconds before lifting its arm. He couldn't look at its face because he couldn't move his neck. He couldn't remember how many fingers it had, but only that it looked completely different from a human hand. One digit touches his forehead, and the next thing he knows is he's laying alongside his partner, and all trace of the aliens in the craft are gone, with the exception of broken branches under the tree that the craft touched. Both my friend's grandfather and his fellow soldier are in near hysterical terror at this point. After they collect themselves enough to try to find the other soldiers, my friend's grandfather realizes he has something in his pocket. It's an egg-shaped stone that looked almost as if it was the same material as the ship. It looked like volcanic rock, except that parallel lines were engraved along its entire surface, like a topographical map. He shows it to the other soldier, who demands that he throw it away. He refuses. They both then told this story to their commanding officer as soon as possible, who must have thought it was some kind of prank because they were both punished. Fearful of people thinking he was insane, since there were schizophrenics in his family, he never told anyone else. After telling this to my friend, he then asks him to open up the safe underneath his bed. Inside it, along with some of my grandmother's jewelry, was an egg-shaped rock. He then asks my friend to take it from him. After his grandfather's death, my friend tells the rest of his family about the rock, but none of them know what to make of it. To this day, my friend keeps it in a shoebox in his childhood bedroom at his parents' house. Back before we stopped hanging out, I encouraged him to show it to someone who would study it, but he said he didn't want anyone to confiscate it since he has a sentimental attachment to it. I feel like he must have had a different reason that he didn't talk about, though. I haven't spoken to him in over five years now, but I still think about this story all the time. There's an edit. Seems like a lot of you want to shoot the story down. I have no idea if his grandfather was the kind of dude to just make up shit on his deathbed. I fell for the story, hook, line, and sinker, from the first time I heard it, though. So maybe... I'm a moron. Okay, so what do I think? Stories passed down are sort of tricky, aren't they? We're so far removed from the life experience of those generations that come before us. It's hard for us to imagine a lot of what they say, much less the extraordinary. We know they didn't have cell phones. Who knows what they did without Netflix and Amazon, right? The cars we drive, the internet, seems all so easy now. But with every generation, there are still challenges, new challenges. It's hard enough, though, to try to listen to someone like a grandfather, telling his life story or a part of it, and then try to put yourself in their shoes, to fully believe that's how it was. You really don't need to consider it, right? Because it's not the way it is for you now. So sometimes we're listening and we're really not taking it all in anyway. You hear about it. Maybe you think it's cute. Maybe you're thankful it's not like that now. But there's one thing that doesn't change from generation to generation. If there are other beings out there, they certainly aren't limiting their visitations and drop-ins to your generation. How open can we be to those that come before us and the stories they tell about their experiences and encounters with creatures from other worlds? For me, I'm going to accept this story, along with my experiences that I've accumulated over the more recent years. I'm willing to be open to this one. In the description, I am leaving you a link to a Roswell arrival and piece of history. No matter how many times someone can reiterate how real something was, it is our reaction to reject it in its total as truth. Why do we think this? To protect ourselves. Why would you want to believe in an unknown invader coming to the one place you cannot run from? It's in our DNA. It's our instinct to survive. And certainly, some otherworldly creature that has landed before you is not something we would choose to believe. There are those that want the experience because they think it will be exciting. For a lot of those that have had the experience, though, it's not as exciting as it might seem on the outside each and every time. For me, this experience that I just shared with you is entirely possible, not just for this man, but for many across the globe. 
A lot of you are used to telling me the true tales of the jobs that me and my team have taken on. Make no mistake, there are others out there with true tales of their own. It's just that when they share them, they're at a disadvantage from the get-go. Anyone sharing an experience is. Try setting aside your instinct for just a few minutes and then give this story another look. You are either open to the idea or you aren't, and you may never will be. And that's what I have to say about this experience. Share your thoughts. And thank you for listening today, and I will talk to you all soon.